All right, thanks for the opportunity to come present. And what I want to do today is just give you an overview of how climate change is projected to affect Western livestock using the work in the Pacific Northwest as essentially a, a delivery mechanism because many of the impacts that are projected in the Northwest are, are similar across the West with, of course, some um, local differences, but this will give you essentially the big picture. So uh, as was mentioned, the Climate Impacts Group is an interdisciplinary research group based at the University of Washington. We've been studying the impacts of climate variability and climate change on Pacific Northwest communities and natural systems since 1995 with the purpose of, pre of, of producing scientific information that's actually useful to and used by decision makers. A lot of the work I'm going to show you today is a combination of work that we've done. I've pulled information from the U.S. National Assessment, recognizing that you all are coming from different parts of the country, uh, and, 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 and particularly uh, wanting to make sure that I could show uh, impacts across the West. Uh, so, you know, just to, just to acknowledge that the work that I'm showing you today is not all of our work. Uh, in fact, much of it is not, but I want to at least let you know that we are available as a resource for those of you who are based in the Pacific Northwest to help you with questions that you may have regarding the impacts of climate change on issues of concern to you. So I want to start with my conclusions. You all remember when Harry met Sally, and Sa I think it was Sally who always had to jump to the end of the book and, and read the, yes, yeah, so here, here we go. So there are several major mechanisms by which climate change will affect agriculture and livestock production. Uh, a couple or two areas are physiological impacts, so the direct impacts of heat, for, for example, on animals, plants, and people. And by that, I mean, I want to acknowledge that these heat impacts affect uh, the farmers working with the livestock, farm laborers, but also are affecting the, the animals and plant productivity. Also changes in crop yields, ranges in productivity, which can affect food and, and feedstock prices, reduce summer water supply, and increasing fire risk uh, and increased pressure from invasives in pasture lands and range lands. So those are the generally the things I'm going to focus on in my talk today. But most importantly, when, where, and to what degree these impacts affect individual producers or even sub-regions, Washington versus Idaho versus Oregon producers, for example. It's really going to depend on location, the rate of change, how quickly we see climate change unfold, and the ability to adapt both at the individual level and at the commercial or industry level. One of the things about the ag research is that it's, it's in some ways it's the silver lining when we talk about climate impacts. The ag community has an incredible ability to adapt because they're already so used to dealing with widely varying conditions that, you know, when people hear about these changes, they're like, ah, I see, you know, more significant impacts from one year to the next. And I want to recognize that that is the strength of the ag community. However, this, these changes still may result in additional cost and tools. Uh, that are required to help manage the changes, and they are something that is very much uh, needs to be kept in mind as, as people look long term for planning. And, and there will be trade offs and changes and costs associated with these impacts. So, as I mentioned, I, I brought in some information from the U.S. National Assessment to give you that big picture perspective. And what, I, what we do know, and what's very clear from research, is that rising greenhouse gas emissions are expected to result in significant warming in the coming decades. That's even if we go with a very low emission scenario, what's called RCP 2.6, which assumes a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the end of this century. Uh, even in that scenario, we see warming in the range of three to four degrees, depending on what part of the country you live in. The RCP 8.5 at the bottom right is, I believe I have a laser pointer somewhere, uh, is a more aggressive scenario. It's considered the business as usual scenario, and in that case, we see warming in the range of about eight to 10, 12 degrees Fahrenheit, again, depending on what, these, depending on what part of the country you're in, and these are changes in average annual temperature uh, for specifically end of century 2071 to 2099. Changes in precipitation are more variable, so while we had a very clear and robust finding for temperature where all the models are in agreement that we'll get significant warming, 
Changes in precipitation really depend on the season and where you're located. In general, under both a very low emission and high emission scenarios, we see uh, wetter winters and springs, but uh, summer, it's really kind of dependent. You see summer drying in the Northwest, we're actually projected to see uh, increased summer drying and essentially an enhancement of our seasonal cycle. Uh, but in a low emission scenario, maybe very little change. Fall is one of those seasons where, under, regardless of the scenario, there's really very little change seen nationally. So, you know, people will often ask, should, you know, are we going to get wetter, drier, warmer, cooler, or, or I mean, uh, what are, you know, do we get, you know, are we going to have drier or warmer conditions or, you know, warmer and wetter conditions? And you said basically we're going to have that. We're, we should plan on warmer conditions, but we're still going to have, uh, we're still going to have wet years, we're still going to have dry years, we're still going to have above average years, below average years. The issue is that the average around which we vary is changing over time. We also expect to see more extreme events as a result of climate change, both in terms of temperature and precipitation. And what I'm showing here uh, specifically is a figure that shows projected changes in the 20-year storm event, the 20-year rain event. And as a result of climate change, what is currently now a 20-year event is projected to occur two to five times more frequently. Uh, again, depending on which emission scenario you look at and depending on what part of the country that you live in. This is very true for the Northwest, even though we have very mixed information about exactly how precipitation will change. One of the robust findings coming out of the precipitation modeling for the Northwest are projections for more extreme precipitation, uh, particularly as a result of these atmospheric rivers, which bring a lot of moisture into our region and then cause uh, a lot of flooding and erosion, uh, in, particularly in Western Washington and Western Oregon but also that's a factor in California as well. So I, I want to just note that for those of you who are based in the Northwest, we have uh, specific seasonal temperature and precipitation projections, projected changes in extreme events uh, for the Northwest. I've shown you national scale information, but do know that we have information specific to this region. I just didn't have the time to show you those as well. So I want to now you know, kind of stay at the scale of the Northwest and talk about the four key issues affecting the Pacific Northwest livestock industry, recognizing that the story in the Northwest is a very common story, I think, across the West. And the place I want to start with first is water supplies. So because of warming winter temperatures, we expect to see significant declines in snowpack in the Northwest. And this is because as you get warming winter temperatures, more of our winter precipitation is falling as rain rather than snow. So, and, and actually this year is a great example of kind of the climate change world in the sense that this past year, this past winter, we were on average in the Northwest about, well, at least in Washington state, about three and a half degrees above average temperature-wise, but our precipitation was actually normal. This, so this year is not a, a precipitation drought. This year is a snow drought. And that is primarily, you know, so the rain was falling. It just wasn't falling as snow. So there's been a lot of conversation as to where, you know, when we look at the projections, kind of where does a winter like this sit? And depending on the emission scenario, it's anywhere from about the 2040s to the 2070s. So this is essentially mid-century change that we are experiencing this winter with our record low snowpack. Who gets affected by that? We will see in the coming, in the coming um, um, season. And of course, there are lots of drought workshops happening, which should guarantee a very wet, cool spring and summer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all scenarios showing less, uh, less snow. And these changes in snowpack and stream flow have a profound impact on how water moves through rivers and streams that are fed by snow melt. So this is a hydrograph for the Yakima Basin. And that solid black line, so this is going from October to September, which is how water managers uh, define their year, the water year. And the black line is showing you the historical runoff pattern in the Yakima Basin, where you see a small uptick in the fall with the return of the fall rains. Then it gets cold enough for snow to start accumulating in the basin, so stream flows actually go down. And then in the spring, the snow melts, and you get the big spring surge. What we see is because of warming temperatures, by the 2080s, we're looking at the, the red dashed line. You see that the, 
the most stream flow is coming off now in November, December, January instead of the spring. So a fundamental transformation in the timing of runoff in the Yakima Basin with substantial declines in spring runoff and, and then summer stream flows as well. So this will affect the availability of water supply for irrigation and with also increasing demand for other water uses such as fish flows, municipal and industrial flows. So in those areas where there is the need, there, there are a lot of uh, ag, and ag to urban area transfers, you could see increased pressure for those water transfers to the municipal areas uh, as they are also responding to increasing demand for water. Research looking at how this affects prorationing uh, in the Yakima Basin found that uh, during the, for the, the water shortage years in the Yakima are projected to increase from 14% of years historically to 43 to 68% of years by the 2080s for both a low and a medium greenhouse gas emission scenario. So again, underscoring the fact that these changes in water supply will affect the amount of water available for irrigation and we would expect to see uh, more shortages occurring uh, absent uh, transfers between users. So now I'd like to switch to food production. And this is, to describing how climate change may affect food production is very much like describing the American people uh, in the sense of there's no one definition of what the American people is and there's really no one answer as to how changes, how climate change may affect production of cereal grains and, and other food crops. You see tremendous, tremendous variability in the results, both between crop types and even within the same crop type, depending on different assumptions made in the study, different levels of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, different assumptions about water supply availability. So I, you know, I had to keep a very high level here just to say that you know, we do expect to see uh, changes in crop production. The winners and the losers will depend on the extent to which this list of impacts really helps or not specific crops. So increased summer heat stress will be a factor for many crops, uh, but you also see a lengthening of the growing season, which could benefit some crops. Decreased summer water supply we've talked about will certainly affect irrigated crops. The longer growing seasons I mentioned may benefit some crops. More winter precipitation and milder winters could help, uh, for example, for winter wheat. Uh, the CO2 fertilization effect is an interesting one where because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, you actually see a positive response initially in plant growth. However, there is a limit to that where eventually the temperatures and water restrictions can essentially overtake the benefit of that increased CO2. So in many cases with these crop responses, you see an uptick or a benefit in the, or in the response, a positive response, and then it starts to tail off. And then changes in plant diseases, pests and weeds could also create new stress as competition uh, for specific crops. So now I'd like to switch to rangeland and pasture land. So here the primary issues are changes in productivity, nutritional value, invasive species, and fire risk. Uh, so we do expect that in cooler climates, such as in higher elevations, you actually see benefits for rangeland because you get earlier snow melt and a longer growing season. However, there, and there are always howevers, <laughs> uh, we do, there, there is research showing that experiments with, um, in, with short grass steppe species found that reduced digestibility in some of those uh, grasses with, as a result of higher CO2. You could get more pressure from invasive species moving into those rangelands. And, Certainly those rangelands that are already in arid and semi-arid zones could be further stressed by the projections for warmer temperatures and drying um, and, and less precipitation, particularly in those summer months. So as I mentioned, wildfire risk is an issue. So research that we've done at our group here at the Climate Impacts Group looks at, has looked at changes in fire risk across the Northwest. And as a result of the warming temperatures, changes in precipitation, and also reductions in snowpack, you see essentially a lengthening of the fire season. And as these are, uh, this is a figure showing generally the percentage of uh, increase, the projected increase in area burned uh, depending on location, ranging from 100 to 200 percent uh, to upwards of 600 to 700 percent in the uh, interior northwest as a result of warming temperatures. 
So in terms of pasture and forage lands, similar story as with the rangelands, uh, although there's little research relatively that's been done on pasture grasses, uh, there is a similar finding about the potential for reduced digestibility with uh, increasing temperatures and increasing CO2. Uh, although some climate and crop growth models suggest an increase in alfalfa production. Uh, so to the extent that that, uh, you know, with the big caveat assuming water is not limiting and we've, we've talked about how that could be an issue in some areas. So I want to wrap up with impacts on milk and beef production. So uh, uh, this is also information from the Northwest chapter of the National Climate Assessment. So with increasing CO2, there's actually research has shown that it takes longer to, to finish, to reach finished weights for beef. So a doubling of CO2 relative to pre-industrial increases the number of days by about two to two and a half percent. Uh, by uh, tripling of the CO2 increases the number of days to about 15% to achieve finishing weight. Uh, in a separate study, projected losses for the Washington and Oregon beef industry associated with climate change ranged from $7 million in the near term to $67 million by the 2080s. And this is due to a combination of factors uh, that, could be, uh, that would be affecting the beef industry. And then we also see decreases in milk production with increasing temperature. So this is some work that was done by Guillaume Moget and our group looking at how changes in temperature over, would affect milk production nationally. The figure on the left just shows projected changes in temperature for a moderate greenhouse gas emission scenario. And then the figure on the right is showing the actual decreases, the average daily loss in milk production. In this case, uh, Temperature and humidity are the important factors governing the changes in milk production. And just uh, what I'm not showing here is that these costs were actually quantified. So, for example, in the Yakima Basin, the summer production losses by the 2050s are about 0 0.7 pounds per day per cow for a total of $3.7 million per year. That's the loss in milk production in the Yakima Basin specifically by the 2050s. So as I mentioned, a lot of the work that I'm showing you is drawn from the U.S. National Assessment as well as the Pacific Northwest chapter that was developed for the U.S. National Assessment. When you go to the U.S. National Assessment, there is the, the Northwest chapter itself is about 8 or 12 pages. There was a 300-page companion report that was essentially developed as technical input. That's this middle document here that has a really nice chapter on agriculture. A lot of the information I, I was showing you today for the Northwest was pulled from that chapter. And that is, all of these documents are available as PDFs, so you can uh, easily access these documents. The one on the far right, for those of you who are located in the Northwest, is a document we pulled together that essentially provides a kind of a quick state of the knowledge summary in an easy to skim format, lots of bullet points, very user friendly. Uh, that it's kind of the quick reference guide for climate impacts in the Northwest that draws from not only the U.S. National Assessment but other research done in the region. So I would encourage you to look at these documents for more details. As I mentioned, I had to stay very high level because of the time allotted today. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to contact the Climate Impacts Group if you have questions. I also see Chad Kruger sitting back there. I'm going to, Chad, if you want to put up your hand. Chad is uh, the, I, I think, the penultimate climate change and ag guy in Washington State. <laughs> um, so inevitably, if you call me, I would probably call Chad. <laughs> but uh, I also want to put in a plug for the sixth annual Pacific Northwest Climate Science Conference, which was just announced. Um, it'll be November 4th and 5th, and we hope to have a good ag turnout at that conference. So uh, with that, I will take questions if we have time. Or... So thank you. So we have seen in the Northwest, we've seen a decline in snowpack uh, in the range of about 25%. Uh, we have seen earlier runoff and earlier peak runoff, so shifts in the timing of stream flows. We have seen increasing stream temperatures. We have seen 
uh, well, increasing air temperature, about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. We've seen changes in extreme events, although those are often more difficult to prove with statistical confidence because there are, very, there are fewer of those to really de determine if they're, what we're seeing is a robust change. Uh, we've seen changes in fire risk. We've seen changes in marine conditions, uh, ocean acidification, and other things that are all indicative of a changing climate. But I'm, this is where I'm going to put the big caveat in. We cannot at this point say that any of those changes are due to climate change. So there is, you know, there are modes of natural variability that also play an important role in both, you know, near-term and long-term trends in the Northwest. And we just can't prove with statistical confidence at this point that the changes that have been seen can be directly attributed to climate change. But what's really important about what we have seen is that the changes that we've seen, which are being driven by warming temperatures, are are illustrative of how climate change will affect us. So even though we can't say that the declines in snowpack that have been observed to date and the re glacial recession, that's another one, that have been observed to date are due to climate change, they are indicative of what we expect to continue happening as a result of human activities, as a result of rising greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, they give us an idea of what our sensitivity is and where we're vulnerable to climate change overall. There was one more here. Uh, I recently heard a presentation where they were talking about stream temperatures affecting fish hatching, mm -hmm. showing that under warming conditions, fish will hatch, these anadromous fish may hatch three months ahead of normal hatching season, mm -hmm. which changes the whole food profile of these new fish. And I didn't know if you had any anything that went to that depth? Yeah, so I'm not sure what the, um, how temperatures affect the salmonids in terms of the hatch time. So we do know that climate change is affected to affect salmon across their life cycle, and this is relevant because <laughs> the habitat management and, and managing for salmon really drives a lot of water management decisions. So we do expect, for example, that um, Higher winter stream flows increase the chance for stream bed scour events, which could damage salmon reds. We do know that earlier peak stream flows affects the ability of juvenile salmon to go out to the estuaries. So you get a mismatch in the timing as to when they're physiologically ready to enter the estuaries versus when those flows are ready to carry them to the water, I mean, carry them to the estuaries. And in the summer, the warmer summer stream temperatures can create both temperature barriers because the water is too warm for salmon to, to migrate back to their spawning grounds, and also physical barriers when the water is just too low and they can't get to where they need to go. Then there are changes in the ocean that could affect salmon as well, but we don't have a good sense as to whether the changes in the ocean will benefit or kind of add to the woes for salmon. But we do know, that at least on the freshwater side, that we expect to see changes that all that that intersect with multiple life stages. And depending on when salmon are, are using certain streams at different life stages, you would expect to see you know, those climate impacts affecting those salmon through these multiple ways. <laughs>